Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where in the world it is that you're tuning in from today. My name is Amanda Tony. I'm the managing director of Stage 32, and I am so excited for the second year in a row that Stage 32 has partnered with Screenwriting U for National Screenwriters Day. And it's only appropriate that half the people in the screen right now are all drinking coffee because that's definitely <laughs> useful for screenwriters. Um, just to let you know, we have some wonderful panelists in front of you. They're going to be talking for about an hour, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A with everybody here in the room. Um, one thing I want everybody to do right now is if you have a cell phone, I want you to take it out, and I want you to turn on your camera from your cell phone. And what I'm going to have the, you guys do is take a picture of all the panelists that are in front of you. Um, so if I can have the panelists have a big, huge smile right now so you don't get any funny faces. Awesome. And everybody take pictures of the panelists. And what I love everybody to do is go ahead and tweet that out on Twitter right now with the hashtag of National Screenwriters Day. And if you could also include um, at Stage32 and at Screenwriting You. Um, that would be amazing, but let's go ahead and keep National Screenwriters Day trending. All right, and then the next thing I want to do before we get started is I just want to tell everybody how to use the questions feature during the Q&A portion. Um, take a look at your control panel that's up on your screen, and you'll see a bar that says questions, and then go ahead and click open the box. That'll look kind of like a chat box, and in there, can you just type in for me where you're tuning in from, either what city you're from or what state you're from, what country you're from, just go ahead and type that in. That'll let me know you guys know how to use the questions box and it'll give me an idea of who's here today. All right, I'm gonna read some of these out loud, you guys, so you know who's here. Los Angeles, Georgia, Panama City, Panama, Burbank, Detroit, LA, Denver, Iowa, Toronto, New Jersey, St. Louis, UK, Pennsylvania, LA, South Carolina, Burbank, Maryland, Seattle, New York, Austin, um, Australia, Santa Monica, Washington, D.C., Vancouver, San Diego, uh, wow, uh, Germany, um, New York, Florida, Arizona, Connecticut, yeah, we got Scotland, Scotland's in the house, love it, um, Spain, someone's here from Spain, Brazil, Jamaica, um, have fun, guys. Holy cow, this is awesome. Mexico, have a blast. All right, well, I'm going to turn it on over to you, Hal. you got a great crew here. All right, go ahead and turn it on over and we'll do a Q&A later. Cool. Well, welcome from all over the world. It's quite astounding the kind of people that we have here. Uh, today, we've got two exciting things going on. So first, it's National Screenwriters Day. And uh, and so we've already had a lot of success with that. Um, we were already trending, uh, trending on Twitter. So uh, that was one of our goals for the day. Today, our second exciting thing is we have some amazing panelists that uh, we're looking forward to talking with and understanding their world and what's happening in their part of the industry. Uh, and I'll be asking them questions and, and going through that process. And then at the end of this, we'll do a Q&A, so you'll get a chance to ask your own questions. So let's start by having each of our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, maybe we could start with Patrick, if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, my name is Patrick Raymond. I work for a company called Mandalay Pictures in Los Angeles. I worked here for about three years. Um, I am, uh, went to USC, um, worked in actually not in the film industry for the good chunk of my uh, early career, um, worked in the financial services world. And then I transferred into the film industry, worked at a, a talent agency for as an assistant and then worked for a couple of producers um, and a feature director. And um, yeah, now I'm the creative exec over at Mandalay Pictures. So I read a lot of scripts. I work with a lot of writers. I help um, package films and produce films here um, and uh, mainly focus on, you know, development. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much me. Okay, cool. I'll be asking you some questions about development in just a little oh. bit. Uh, let's go to Nicole. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Rana DeVay. I am a writer and um, I work mostly in TV, but I write both TV and features. And um, when I moved to LA many years ago, I didn't know a soul. I didn't know what I was doing. And um, I somehow got a job as an assistant. And um, from there, 
realized that I wanted to write and it's been um, an amazing ride, but it's definitely been a ride and a lot of hard work and I had some ups and downs and I'm finally, um, you know, back on track and, and, and working on some pretty cool shows and, um, and I love it. Excellent. Very good. And RB? Uh, Rich Botto, most of you know me as RB. I'm the founder and CEO of Stage 32. Um, I'm also a writer. I started as an actor in New York in the theater scene. When I moved out to LA, I started producing films and writing. Uh, some of the films I produced have played at Sundance and Cannes Short Corner and things like that. Uh, currently have a script at Covert Media. They are financing and producing called The Endgame, uh, which we're now currently in the, uh, the process of casting. And I am also, shameless plug, the author of This is a Card. This is the actual book of uh, crowdsourcing for filmmakers, which just came out a couple of months ago. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that. It's not just for filmmakers, for screenwriters as well. Well, and, and since we're talking about that, let's go ahead. So um, tell us about that. What, what, how does a screenwriter use crowdsourcing? How does a filmmaker use that? Well, a lot of people confuse crowdsourcing with crowdfunding. This is the first book on actually on crowdsourcing, which is about building an audience for you and your brand, uh, the brand of you, the brand of your material, which comes first, actually, when you're first starting out. So in this day and age where everybody's trying to control their own content and obviously make a name for themselves in the era of social media and online marketing and online branding, it's never been more important for you to be able to establish a brand. Your content, of course, is going to stand out eventually but you know how do you get the brand of you and the brand of your content out there and that's really what the book is all about it came from a talk i gave at afm a few years ago and after i was done talking i got approached by focal press which is the film side of rutledge uh publishing and uh they asked me to write this book and it, it really was enlightening to me because you know going through the process of interviewing all these people for the book about you know 100 150 interviews and then three very big case studies it was interesting speaking to the to the screenwriters mostly because a lot of these um, a lot of these writers were first time writers and they didn't really know how to get themselves out there and it wasn't until they kind of embraced this idea of you know who are they what it, what's their brand and how do you identify engage and move an audience for that brand that they actually started to get some traction so that's really encapsulating kind of what the book is about. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's like an advanced level of networking and, and making sure that the, yeah. your audience knows who you are. Very Excellent. important. Cool. Uh, let's go up to Patrick. So Patrick, um, maybe you can tell us, what does it take nowadays to get a movie made? Man, um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I can't speak to the, uh, the studio system really. Um, you know, we are a finance, we're a, a film production company that really um, technically doesn't bring financing to the table. We, we have financing partnerships, but I would say that like the, you know, the key, the key is always first and foremost, a great script. I mean, that's the one thing that I look for all the, like, that's what I, that's what I do this job for is to, is, is to find, um, something that really just moves me in all kinds of ways. And, um, so that's the first step. And then the second most important thing I'd be, I think would be, you know, access to get, what, what is it going to take to get this movie made? Most of the time, you know, it's money. And um, so having access to, to financing or financing partnerships or whatever, um, I would say those are probably the two biggest ingredients. Um, obviously, if you have a relationship with like a prestige, you know, a filmmaker that can get a movie made um, or a producer or, you know, any sort of relationship with talent, um, all of that kind of, you know, needs to come together. All three of those things need to come together in order to get a movie made. And, um, you know, you're sort of beholden to the, uh, you know, the politics of the town as well as the schedule of talent and production companies and um, various financiers, um, business models and all of that stuff. So it's really, you're constantly kind of playing chicken and egg with a lot of different people and a lot of different eggs, but all trying to get in the same bucket at the end of the day. So, so how much of that has to do with the script? Are there, are there things that can be done in the script that increase your chance of being able to get financing and, and get it into the doors you need it to go in? 100%. You know, I think it depends on what, you know, who the audience is, 
and what type of money we're talking about and who that, you know, who the financing partner is and all of that. But I would say that like, you know, um, it always, people always read a, and want to read and want to make a really good script that that's never really changed. I feel like in the history of all of with everything happening with Netflix and Amazon and all the SVOD, everything totally changing landscape, people still gravitate towards, you know, elevated character driven material. And I think you see that on the television side a lot, which I'm sure Nicole can talk about, but on the feature side, it's still extremely, um, potent, you know, to get anything. Um, so when I, when I have a really good script, yeah, sure, it might have a little bit of baggage, but um, I'm going to go to financing partners that that a I think will hopefully have a similar um, taste level as myself. You know, I mean, if I have like a high concept drama, you know, I'm not necessarily you know Jason Blum Blumhouse wouldn't necessarily be the first place I would call, but. You know, so it's sort of like understanding the landscape of like who you're talking to and what, you know, what who can 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 really be effectively a good collaborator. You know, um, if it's a one to two million dollar budget range, you know, that might be something that you know a studio might not necessarily look at, but like maybe an A24 might be interested in or something like that. You know, so um, I think a lot of a lot of my job is trying to figure out who the audience is and like where a good you know who's a good so when you're talking about understanding the landscape um, and picking a good partner, so you're talking about budget, you're also talking about um, what they normally do, what's in their mandate maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think that like, and I tell this to certain screenwriters too, is sort of, you know, stay in your lane in a, in, in a certain way. I mean, you know, I think that the, a lot of the really successful screenwriters that I work with or that I know, know what they're really good at, you know? And I think that the same thing goes with, um, you know, film production partner, producing partners, and, and, and things like that. You know, I think that as long as you, you know, there, there are people that I work with that are not very creative producers that are really, really good at raising money and are really, really good at having talent relationships or really, really good at, um, you know, finding sort of like who the audience is and, and figuring out a distribution plan to cater towards that, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I mean everything is is variable. I would say. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk with Nicole in just a moment about characters. Um, I'm hoping you know from a TV perspective that might be something you want to talk about. Uh, but RB, can you just talk just for a moment? So from an indie perspective, you're also having to raise funds. So what do you have to go through to be able to raise funds to get a movie made? Yeah, I, I and I can take this from two perspectives because I, I totally relate to everything that Patrick's saying with the, the script that we were talking about earlier that's at Covert. You know, it's been a two year process. I signed the deal for this uh, the night before Sundance two years ago. I'm approaching Sundance again. So it's been two years and, you know, the money was in from day one. They were ready to finance this thing. But there's a number of factors that go into this, including uh, pre-sales and, you know, how they how they put these deals together. And, you know, we've had two directors attached to the project. We unfortunately had to get rid of the first one only because it, he wasn't attracting the talent that was going to get covert to where they wanted to be budget wise. So it was unfortunate because the sensibilities of this director for the material were perfect. And uh, but unfortunately, it just didn't work out. And then we just attached the director that had a film at Sundance a couple of years ago. And now we're back out to actors. It's a process. It, it's a very, very long process. And it's it's that's why I tell everybody, I tell all writers, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, you have to continue to be writing. I've, I've listened to so many writers who have said, oh, I got optioned or, oh, you know, I have something in development and, and they're just waiting for that one thing to happen. And you can't. Right. You have to keep moving. Um, so that's from, you know, a writer's standpoint, from, from a producer's uh, producing standpoint. It's difficult because there's more content being created than ever before, which is, you know, the positive thing and the great thing. And it's sort of a gold rush right now of, of people purchasing material and looking for material. But at the same time, that also means that people get to be more selective. And that's one of the problems also with, you know, even attracting talent right now is that they have more options than ever before. Whereas five years ago, you know, if you were going after actor A and actor A was, you know, you would you were 
Dr. Ray had choices between a few different independent films and then some studio fare. Now they also have options of limited series or, you know, a Netflix series or, you know, that they're going to get paid very handsomely for. So it, it's a challenge all the way around. And I, I think that's what makes the, you know, I, I think that's why, again, it's so important that you have an original voice. I think it, I think what Patrick said about, you know, staying in your lane is very, very true and that you know what that lane is and that you know who you are and who you're trying to attract and who you're going after and why knowledge is power as well, because you have to know who you're approaching. You know, you have to know who you're targeting. Um, you know, so, I, you know, you asked about the money. It is difficult for us as a producer, as producers, and it's been difficult for some of the indie projects. But I'm working on one right now that, you know, we have some decent talent, decent talent attached to it, and it's it's not a large budget. But the investors that we've gone to in the past, they're you know they have more options than ever before as well. So they're being much more selective with holding out for a better deal. It's sure. it's a grind, and you got to be on it, and you got to have thick skin, and you got to you know you you got to understand that it's a marathon. And that's really, that's, that'll give you the advantage in a lot of ways. Cause a lot of people just quit. You know, a lot of people just give up. A lot of people throw up their hands. You can't do it. You have to, you know, you have to stay on the grind. Yeah. Almost every movie that gets made has goes through multiple times that you thought it was going to die. Oh, no uh, doubt. So, uh, okay. Let's talk about television for a minute. So, so Nicole, um, first, so you started as an assistant and, mm -hmm. and then started working your way up. Mm -hmm. What, what what are the steps when it comes to breaking into TV? If you're trying to get into a writer's room and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, those jobs, like the writer's assistant is probably the most coveted of positions for an aspiring writer because like you say, it does get you in the room with the writers and you get to interact with them and they get to, you know, get to know you and know you're smart, you're sharp, you're funny or whatever. And um, I actually didn't, I wasn't a writer's assistant, I was a script coordinator, but I was a script coordinator on 24. So it was a different beast. And I actually kind of, uh, my concept of how things worked was a little bit different because there wasn't as much of a writer's assistant um, relationship with the writers as there was as a script coordinator because we produced so many scripts and so many, yep. you know, um, I don't know if you guys are all familiar with the colors of, you know, the revisions we call them. So it goes through revision after revision after revision. Like you don't just write one script and then you go, great, let's go shoot it now. You write a script and then you write revisions of that script. And then maybe you write a whole nother revision, like a full revision of that script. And then you write, so it goes on and on and on. So the script coordinator is the person that proofs that, makes sure it's all, you know, um, the English is correct, you know, whatever, and then puts it in a form for the production to shoot it and then goes out to everybody. So there's a very tight relationship with the writers in that sense. So that's how I kind of got my foot in and they recognized me as a, you know, go-getter and smart and on it. And so I got my first opportunity there, which was um, amazing, you know, so, um, but that, you know, a lot of it is just the luck of the draw where you land because a lot of people when they start and I wasn't, you know, excluded from this, you think, oh, I love that show so much. I want to get on that show. And you focus on one place and you think I'm going to get there and then I'm going to be a writer on that show. And that almost, I've never heard of that working. <laughs> never. You're lucky to get in where you can and then become valuable there and then hope that eventually someday you can maybe write for your ideal place. But, um, you know, you just, as you said, Arby, you just grind. You grind to, you're constantly writing. You have to prove to people that, you know, I'm a writer also. I don't just, I'm not just here saying I want to be a writer. I'm a writer. Here's an example of my writing. So they can see that you're talented. They can see you get it. They can see, you know, that you're, you're dedicated. So that's, so, that's how TV worked for me. And I think from other friends and everybody I know, it's sort of a similar situation. Yeah, you got to get in and do that job in order to get that job. Exactly. And make yourself valuable. One of the things as I kind of climbed the ladder and, and, and you know, got a little perspective, it's really easy to feel like you're above something because on every set, the PA, you know, is kind of the, you know, the starter job. You don't know anything. So you start as a PA, you're getting coffee, you're making copies, you're doing stuff that college educated person, you think, you know, I can do better than this. 
But if you make yourself invaluable in that position, then people want to help you. Then people want to see what more you can do. They want to bring you up. But if you get in and you kind of have an attitude about it or you act like I'm better than this or what I really want to do is write, what I really want to do is direct, it, it rubs people the wrong way sometimes because we all want to do that. Nobody wants to be a career PA, <laughs> you know? For sure, for sure. So I'd like to talk about that a little more in just a little bit. Um, you all have said something about relationships, building relationships. And, and there are a lot of people who are breaking in or just starting as writers. Um, and of course they need to build their craft, but at the same time they need to start reaching out and starting to meet people. Any suggestions or advice on building relationships? And maybe we start with you, Nicole, since you were just talking to go to Patrick and then to Richard. Sure, I mean, Again, I think the best way to do it is to actually get, if you can be lucky enough to get in a job to, you know, prove your worth on a day-to-day -day basis, but even to get there, sometimes you have to network outside. It's a friend of a friend or it's, um, you know, don't be pushy is the, the hard part, but just make yourself available, make yourself a lot of TV, it's very different from features because it's a collective. Um, you're together a lot versus film writing is a lot of you alone in a room. In TV, people want to have to hang out. People want to hang out with you. Like if you're you're forced on them. So if you are a likable, amiable, I'm cool to be around person, that's going to help you more also than being a little cranky or crotchety or you know whatever. So just um, yeah, building the relationships, make yourself available, go on coffee, go on informational interviews. If somebody, you know, is makes himself available, who is doing the job that you want to do, just ask, you know, as if, can I take you to coffee? I'll treat you to a drink, whatever, you know, like whatever I can do for you. If you just talk to me, I'm not asking you for a job. I'm not asking you to do anything for me, but if you can maybe give me some information, maybe some tools, your experience, most people, we've all come up, so we all need that help, that leg up. Most people would be amenable to that, and it's it's a really valuable tool. Excellent. And Patrick, in in for your business, for your where you guys are at, uh, if somebody's actually building a relationship, is it because they're working with you on a project? Is it because you saw something that you really loved? What? How 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 would you advise writers to build a relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, yes. Uh, I, I make a lot of relationships with writers, you know, I love making relationships with really young writers, especially, um, not necessarily, you know, physically young, just new writers. Um, because, you know, a lot of, especially if you read something like I read a lot, I read all the, you know, the Nichols scripts, I read a few of the semifinalists and I, 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 I mine sort of the industry a lot, you know, with the blacklist and all that stuff, trying to find like fresh voices and, you know, I, I always tell like emerging writers that <clears throat> ask for advice, they always want, one of the, the questions I get asked the most is, how do I find an agent? How do I find a manager? You know, how, how do I find somebody that's like, they can in my corner and help me out? Because I can, I can do a certain amount, you know, but at the end of the day, like they really do need, you know, representation to, to kind of guide, help guide their careers. And kind of what Nicole just said, uh, kind of what I, what I used to do, you know, Everything in entertainment is entrepreneurial. You know, even when you work for a big company, you're really working for yourself. You're 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 really selling yourself as a producer, as a CE, as a writer, as a director, any editor, anything. So, um, one of the things that I would do to expand my network when I didn't really know anybody is I would literally just take assistance out to copies, um, and it doesn't cost that much money. And assistants make like twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year, and they would they usually say yes to free food and drinks. So, um, you know, when when I when I say you know with writers, it's like okay, well, like do a little bit of research, find out who who are some of the agents that you know are your dream agents or at your dream agencies, and that's that's all available online. Um, whittle that list down, and then like you know try to get in good with their assistants because you, you know you, you rub their their backs they are going to rub your back you know they're at least going to read your stuff which is you know one degree away from getting representation or even being hip pocketed by an assistant that's on the verge of becoming an agent somewhere or you know that's i think like 
I know I like I have I have agents in various um I've, I've got like probably like three or four really really good like contacts that are like really brand new baby agents that are real awesome or managers that are really great hustlers that became agents and managers because they had been sort of like doing their doing that job with people unofficially for a while and hip pocketing these people that's what they call it um so that's the to me like getting to the assistant is like getting to the life source that's that's what's going to get you into the door um and then i would say like you know part of my job really big part of my job is just expanding my network as as much as i can getting to know you know the more people i know and the more i know about like what their taste levels are like or what their business model is like then the better i can be to, with the relationships that i have with writers and filmmakers um where i you know i i bring a value to the table i'm not just um somebody that can kind of do the nuts and bolts um uh, production but i can also guide you know, I can I can also be the person that can say, hey, you know what? I think this is a great project for Macro, or I don't think this is good for Netflix. Let's try, you know, Open Road or something like that. You know, um, so yeah. I mean, I look, I, I cold calling, emailing, a lot of the agents that I, you know, when I became a creative executive, a lot of the people that I got to know, I literally just emailed or cold called and say, hey, let's grab lunch. Let's grab a if you can't do lunch, let's do a coffee. You know, or let's just come to your office and we'll do a meeting. You know, a lot of people just want to make it as easy as possible for themselves. So just be, you know, kind of put your ego aside and realize like this is like my job here is to make connections. Like one of the things that I did when I was an assistant at the agencies was like I'd work, you know, from nine to seven or whatever, eight to seven. And then from seven, to, I thought of my life as like from seven to midnight was like hustle mode. That was when my job really started. That was when I was like really you know, going out of my way to like meet people and go to go to, you know, drinks and read as many scripts and come up with writers lists, that, the writers that I like to meet, you know, and talk to those agents maybe on the next Monday, et cetera. So it's just kind of like a, it's a grind and a hustle and, and some people are not very good at it. Some people are really good at it, but you can still not be a very, you can be an introverted person and still be a good networker. I think that that's important. Cool. And RB, you know, you're the guy who created Stage 32, right? So maybe you could talk with us about um, how, how could they create relationships from outside of Los Angeles? And, sure. and what's really available? It's, it's not just producers in LA. There are lots of other producers. Yeah, no question. I mean, uh, filmmaking is global. Content creation is global. But I do, I do want to touch on. I, I loved Nicole's and uh, Patrick's answers. I mean, they're great. And what Nicole said about coming from a place of selflessness—that's universal. Okay, if you're going to network, you have to be giving first and asking second, and maybe even third or fourth. So that's monumentally important. And then Patrick saying that you're an entrepreneur, and if you look at your uh, your pursuits with an entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurial mind, you're going to treat everything like a business. You're going to treat everything. You treat your writing like a business. You all want to be successful. You all want to, you know, see your work, see your uh, actors speaking your words on the screen and everything like that. But what about your networking and everything good that's happened for me over the last five or six years really came through stage 32 and came through networking. And I tell that, I tell these stories a lot about how that happened. And people say, well, yeah, but you're the owner. You, you know, you write. So of course it's easy. Not true, okay, because the material still has to win people over. People aren't going to give – there's no charity in this business, okay, um, none. And, you know, it's hard enough. You're not going to get charity. But the other part of it, too, is that, you know, if you're putting yourself out there and you're showing that um, you have a collaborative spirit and that you are willing to, again, help first and, and ask for help second – um, you know, ask what you can give to the other person first, even if it's somebody who's achieved, you know, the highest peaks, there's still something that you can give that person, even if it's a compliment, you know, even if it's something about them that, you know, it, maybe people don't know about if you do your research, you, there's always something to give. And as far as introverts are concerned, I always say, because writer, a lot of writers are introverts and I, and I hear this all the time when I, when I'm out speaking and everything, you know, it's, I don't, it doesn't come natural to me. I get that. But with online 
networking and the fact that you can you know reach anybody anywhere in the world 24 7 365 through social media and through sites like stage 32 or any or you know, the broad-based social media sites you don't have excuses because it's it's you can there's a million ways in okay and i always say that you know a few of those for example are ask questions compliment people on something they posted you know uh share content you read something you found an article you watched the video you like share it okay ask people why this particular piece of content was important to them if they posted it there's a million ways in okay and the other thing is is that look if you start treating it like a job if i always said from the beginning that writing was half of my job and networking was the other half i would spend at least an hour to an hour and a half and i still do whenever i have time available but i certainly spend at least some time every day building relationships, going out there, doing exactly what Patrick said, emailing people, writing to people, reaching out to people, even people overseas. If I see somebody producing something I find really interesting, I'm, you know, I want to know what they're doing next, what brought them to that project, why, 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 you know, and that has done nothing but bear fruit for me over these last five or six years. And I just can't stress it enough. I've had so many people come up to me and say, oh, I don't have time to network. I barely have time to write. And then they'll tell me in the next breath about the six shows they've been binge watched on Netflix. And I'm like, there you go. <laughs> and you know, you got to realize when you do that, and this is the other thing, okay? The way that you network and the way you put yourself out there really, really does reflect on how serious you are about your pursuits, okay? If you're telling people you don't have time, but you're tweeting about, you know, Trump or whatever, you know, 24 seven and people go and look at that, they're going to say you're not serious, you know, controlling your public persona, controlling who you are, controlling your brand, controlling your messaging, all of that matters, especially in this day and age. People are looking at that. People will look at that, especially if they're interested in you. So treat it like a job, treat it with the seriousness that you would. Again, you're an entrepreneur. OK, you have money on the line. Your life is money. Your time is money. Your pursuits are, you know, that's the currency. Right. Don't waste it. Prove to people that you're serious about it. Cool. So let's talk about development. So um, maybe we can start with Patrick, because that's in your job title. Right. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us what do you do as a development exec? Um, I would say, first and foremost, you know, I sort of lead the charge in finding good material, you know, and that includes, as RB said, you know, books, sometimes it's books, sometimes it's magazine articles, newspaper articles, um, whatever. I mean, I think, you know, I'm sort of an information junkie. Um, so it, it becomes sort of second nature for me as far as like, I'm a news junkie, so I'm always reading stuff. And Sometimes I'll read a great, you know, an interesting story and I'll send it to some of my colleagues and see if that's something that, you know, they think would make an interesting movie. Um, I'd say, you know, once we have projects, I think a lot of my job is like providing script notes, working with writers and like, and just like figuring out, you know, going through the checklist of, of you know, what, what we need to do to get this movie to the next level or the script to the next level. And then, um, you know, hopefully having a great relationship with the writer and in, in the way of, of sort of morphing it into that. Um, and then also just sort of, you know, kind of riding the line between um, art and commerce. You know, it's like that part of my job is understanding the business of making a movie. So, you know, working with like the WGA and making sure that everything is legally sound with the writers, you know, the filmmakers that we're working with. Um, but also making sure that the script um, and the story maintain, you know, a, an integrity throughout the whole thing and, and not to lose sight of like what what it is that we love about this project, you know, what it, what and what can make it better without losing um, the essence, you know. So I think that like a lot of my job is sort of sitting by myself and reading a lot, you know, and um, and then lots of time just talking about things with with either other executives here, other producers, um, uh, you know, or with writers. I mean, sometimes we've, we've literally, I've talked with writers for like three hours on, on, a, on something about a very specific part of a movie that ended, ended up actually answering a question to something totally different in like the third act, you know? I mean, sometimes it's just, it's like a therapy session. Uh, <laughs> And so yeah. I, you know, and I'm just talking to people and I'm, you know, so I'm also kind of the intermediary between 
you know, a lot of the creatives and then some of like the more like suit like people, you know, quote unquote. So, so are you, are you essentially getting notes from the other people in the office and then taking sometimes. them back to the writer? Yeah, sometimes it depends. I mean, like uh, oftentimes I'll be the first to read like the new draft of something mm -hmm. and, um, and then I'll give my sort of initial, you know, sort of notes and, and buffer or I'll create like more of a soft landing, you know, if it's something that I think might be, um, that I might need to like treat with a little bit of nuance, I guess, called political nuance in the office, then um, I can be that person, you know, to help guide the process um, that way. But yes, I also collect notes collectively and, you know, relay the information the best I can. So could you talk with us just a little bit about the process of giving notes? Are, are you, do you, do you try to bring it down to the ones that you think are most important? Uh, how do you usually do that? Yeah. I mean, look, I think of things like, like if I was a writer, what kind of notes would I want? You know? And I think that, you know, there are certain executives out there that are very, very, you know, deep, extremely detailed and binary and like, you know, really into like, oh, well, this was missing, this sentence was missing a comma list, but you know, I'm not like that really. I mean, I, um, I kind of like, the, I would say my process is I read something, I usually, if I'm reading something for the first time, I, I know this sounds really um, sophomoric, but the best indicator I can I have initially on whether or not I'm really enjoying a script is if I lose the page count. Yeah. I, I don't look at like wh where I am. And I would say um, then I kind of take it and I look at like broad stroke things. You know, I look at mainly like structure stuff, character stuff. What, you know, how did I feel about something? Um, when I was an assistant at, uh, at the Gersh agency, I used to read a lot and then I, I didn't really, it was hard for me to like think of or express my opinions. And then I started reading privately for one of the, the senior um, partners there. And he sort of got me to start engaging into like why I like something, why if I don't like something, what is it specific? What is it on a broad strokes that I don't like about it? And okay, and then I, I can sort of delve into that and say, all right, well, that was my broad stroke note. Here are my here are those pillars of why I think this isn't working. And so that's kind of how I approach, you know, I break scripts down. And so I kind of look at it like as a broad strokes palette. I'll usually talk to the writer, say, you know what, here's like three or four big things that I, I felt, good and bad, because you don't want to just be the bearer of bad news all the time. Most of the time, it's your, you know, your you're sort of my job is to give constructive criticism all the time, you know, so I can't, I also have to be like a sort of a source of light. Um, and then I would say, okay, then I'll normally get like a draft, you know, however long after that. And then I usually go through and I do like specific page notes and those are, you know, line notes, like dialogue stuff. Um, that's when I really start to get like my hands dirty. And um, I think that, you know, that's been really helpful because I will also kind of cognitively evaluate whether or not the other notes have been addressed, you know, because the, the big notes are the ones that I'm like worried about. Those are the things that really need to be fixed. And then the, the page notes are more, you know, um, also extremely important, but um, hopefully if those are executed properly, then you know, the writer will um, at least have a better focus on like, okay, how to fix the, these bigger notes. Cause it always starts with, you know, you can't just say poor diet, like the dialogue is pretty bad. You can't say that. You'll say, okay, well, why is it bad? It just doesn't, you know, and, and it's sometimes it's really hard to describe, you know, what it is about dialogue that's not working um, other than, you know, some of the things I'll say is like, just, just practice saying that out loud because a writer is going to see the script and they're going to read it out loud. And it, how is that going to sound? You know? Um, so I think it's constant. It's just like mowing a lawn, you know, it's like, you can't, you know, if you have a really, really long, uh, long grass, you can't put the mower on the, on the, you know, the inch blade, you got to kind of have to go through it a couple of times. And that's kind of the way that I do it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Nicole, you, you've actually written scripts for 
three or four shows. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is it more than yeah. that? Am I okay? Yeah. <laughs> and so I look at the feature thing, and I think, wow, at least at least people in the feature world get to listen to the notes and then go mm -hmm. home. Right. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably very different in the in the TV world. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. Having not done the feature, sold a feature, or, or optioned a feature myself, I, I, I don't know for sure. But yeah, from what it sounds like, I mean, the biggest difference I would say, and also from friends who have done it, is the timetable. In TV, it's so immediate because you're on a schedule, and that show is going to production in three weeks, and you need it done for them to film it. And in features, it sounds a little more, you have a little more time sometimes, you have a little more, you know, leeway in, in, in getting those notes uh, done and turned around and all that stuff. And then in TV, there's also um, almost always, unless you are the showrunner, someone above you overseeing everything that you do. And if it's not exactly the way that they want it or they would envision it, then they'll usually at that point sort of go, okay, great, but I'm going to take my own little like pass to make sure it's exactly, you know, what I want. And in TV, it's never, I've never heard anybody say we had all the time we needed. It's exactly the way we wanted it. And what was shot was genius. You know, it's never enough time. It's always, uh, you know, just rush to the finish line. But um, if you're lucky and you, you know, have really talented people and, and people that are fast. I mean, that's another thing in TV. They like you, if you can be, to be fast so that there's not, you know, so much more work to be done after you've done your part. Um, and uh, you actually get to see, I mean, that's another thing I've heard from friends in Feature World. There's never a guarantee whether it's going to actually be made or be distributed in TV. You're going to see that on the air, most likely. Um, and it's pretty satisfying, you know, just, and it's not always hundred percent yours. It's usually, you know, some yours, mostly yours, sometimes a little bit yours, but always you were part of it and it, you know, that, that part feels pretty great. But yeah, between TV and film, um, in that sense, it's it, timetable is the biggest difference, I think. Uh, so, so let me ask you something on that. So when the when the episode is assigned to you aren't aren't you at that point have, don't you already have a uh um a complete outline haven't you guys already hashed it out inside the room and all that kind of thing or is it where is it usually it depends on the show um sometimes really the showrunner is the one who decides who is going to write what episode so sometimes you're in the room and you're all working out an episode and then it's basically beat out um, and then the showrunner will go, okay, Nicole, you're going to go write this, go off and outline it. Other times, you know, from the get go, either you've pitched the idea yourself because you know, you're writing episode three. So you come in with an idea for episode three and then everybody helps you uh, break it down and then you go off and outline it. So it, it really depends. But once you've outlined it, you usually know it's yours and that you're going to, to write it. Sometimes they team you up with another writer who's not your official partner, but you co-write it with um, another person. And I personally love that. That's always fun for me also. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's more fun when you can do it with somebody else. So cool. Uh, R RB, what's your experience with notes? You've, you've taken notes and given notes, right? Yeah. What's, what's, what's it like for you? Uh, definitely been on both sides of the fence. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of writers out there that, uh, you know, are new to taking notes. And I, and I promise you and assure you, it gets easier. I know when I got notes on my first script, and this was even after I was producing getting notes to other people, I thought that everybody was giving me notes was crazy and insane. And they didn't get my vision and they didn't understand me. And how the hell did they miss that? And I went through all the, you know, Almost, I guess that the, the seven stages of grief. I guess only, uh, you know, whatever the hell, uh, how many stages they are, but only in, in taking notes. Um, it becomes easier. I think that you know, I think that you have to realize, for the most part, especially if they're coming from a trusted source. I think it's more difficult to get notes from an anonymous source. You know, when you're using sort of a broad-based uh, general service, let's say, um, than it is from a trusted source. And I think the reason for that is is that you don't know whether that person had a bad day, whether it touched them the wrong way, whether, you know, it could be anything. And you don't know what's what's impacting that. And that's, of course, part of the subjective nature of all this. But um, 
you know, what I came, once I started to, you know, network and, or use services where I knew exactly who was reading my notes and who I maybe could talk to or, you know, follow up with, it became easier because I realized that everybody was in the business of trying to make me better and to, you know, make me a better writer and to make the story better and to serve the story. Um, true story. Patrick has read, uh, read something of mine recently and, uh, you know, gave me great notes and he gave me, but you know, what was great about it was that and this is, I guess where I'm, I'm coming from is that they were things to think about, you know, things about story to think about and things about, you know, character to think about. And I think if you come from a place of openness and honesty and, and, uh, you know, you're honest with yourself and you allow yourself to be open that, and you allow yourself to parse the information that's being given to you and understand that you don't have to apply everything. You just have to think about it and see if it's going to serve it better. Once you get that, and that takes time, you know, but once you get there, you realize that, you know, the, the, what you, the feedback you're getting is constructive and it's designed to make you, again, to make you either a better writer or make, when you're starting out or later on to make the story better. Um, so that's been my experience. You know, giving notes, it's the same thing. It's, it's you know, you want to see what's going to serve the story best. I actually tell you a really quick story. When, when the end game first went to my manager, it was great from, from the standpoint of we had, he had very few notes, but the ones that he had, they were first act notes. There were two scenes and I, we re, reworked these two scenes. I mean, probably for two months and every, and I kept adding and adding and adding. And I felt like what I was giving was, uh, too much uh, exposition, really. I felt like it was just too, too much. I'm like, we're banging them over the head with this information. And what he said to me, he goes, look, he goes, you know, it's, on, in, it's in your head, it's not on the page. And he goes, you understand this world, a lot of people don't. And he said, look, we have to sell people on this. And then later on, we could take some of it out. But right now you have to sell people on it. And I, you know, I hated it because I felt like it was really kind of weakening the story and, and going against everything that you've been taught, which is not to have these characters spitting all this exposition out there. But this is a guy that's been doing it for 30 something years. So I had to say, you know, look, he, he knows his shit. He knows what he's talking about. Let me, you know, let me. And sure enough, when I, fa when I finally sat down with Paul at Covert and I said to him, I go too exposition heavy in the beginning. And he goes, actually, he goes, it was very helpful for me to understand the world. He goes, now, do we have to film it that way? He goes, no. But again, it was one of these things where I had to be less precious about the writing and really listen to what was behind the note, you know what I mean? Which was that we have to, we have to, we have to inform people about this world. The director will be able to show that on screen, but right now you have to use it as sort of a selling point to what this world is all about. So it's, it's just little things like that. You can't be precious. You have to be open and you, you know, you have to be honest with yourself at all times. Right. The, the whole purpose is to improve the script and increase right. the chance of, the, of something happening, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, cool. So that, that brings us to this question, which is what constitutes a great script? So any of you can talk about that. Who, who would like to jump in? What, what actually, you know, what makes something a great script? Well, TV, you, I'm sure Nicole can probably... I mean, it, as you guys said, it's so subjective, obviously, but um, I think um, Patrick's, uh, you know, um, take on basically when you lose yourself in the script, he loses page count, he doesn't know where he is because you're not thinking about all the 2,500 other things you have to do that day or how you're going to say no to this script because there's so many out there that you, you, most of them are going to get said no to. So if you... Sometimes I don't know why I love a script until I really think about it, or I don't know why I don't really like a script until I really think about it. That's a really hard thing to do too. Like Patrick was saying, just like when I first started, it took me a while to figure out what my voice was, to figure out how to critique something, to figure out why I thought something was good or not good. Um, but really, if you are enjoying it and you don't even know why you're enjoying it, I mean, that's probably the best kind of assessment I could get for something. And then I can come up with, oh, it's because it, it kind of pushed this button in me or it sort of spoke this piece of me or I didn't have a whole bunch of questions. I just lost myself in it. I didn't like, you know, think that character was dumb. I just went with it, you know, it's, it's very elusive, but um, 
enjoyment is, you know, key. I, I, I don't know what else to say other than the technical aspects of this was, you know, um, this was beat out very well. This was constructed very well. The story had all the elements I need in it. Everything was paid off. I mean, those are technical things, but you know, it is a talent. So hopefully you have, you can learn so many things, but hopefully you have an innate talent for storytelling and Good. You love, cool. it. love comes on the page too. Uh, somebody once said to me, you know, the world can be, a, you know, the worlds are variables and you know, the worlds could be anything. The characters always have to be great. You know, the characters are everything. And it's putting these exceptional characters into these, you know, it could be an ordinary world or it could be an extraordinary world, but it's got to be the characters have to resonate and the characters have to arc and the characters have to, you know, the characters have to win the day. And that was really interesting to hear. Uh, this is another person who's been in the business for a long time, that's been writing for a long time, but they said, look, you know, the, the world is great and, and the creativity of the world is great, but it doesn't mean anything if the characters aren't phenomenal, if the characters don't jump. Excellent. Patrick, now you're ready to weigh in. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I honest to God think that it, like the biggest barometer is page count, losing myself in it. Um, I tend to go for like character driven stuff, less exposition, um, less is more to me. So I'm, like the faster I'm sort of like reading through something, the more I process it, the easier I process it all. Um, but I, you know, I love, I love scripts that sort of, uh, tell, you know, interesting story. I'm, you know, we've talked about Manchester by the sea on here and things like that. I mean, like you can write a, literally a script about, you know, a plumber on, in, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and it could be one of the best, you know, stories you ever heard, you know? So I think that like, it just depends on, you know, conflict, lots of layered conflict, great characters, great settings, um, interesting settings. It's something that I haven't seen before. That's one thing that I, read a lot of scripts that, that are they're fine but they're also like I've seen this I've seen this movie before I've read this thing before so finding something fresh finding a new voice you know, it's fun when you when you get a really really talented writer that knows themselves so well you really get a, a good picture of like kind of like a Wes Anderson where you, you watch a Wes Anderson movie you see his thumbprint all over the movie you know what I mean there's a lot of writers that have a similar disposition it's fun to to recognize that yes Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so maybe we can talk a little bit about communication, about how people communicate inside this industry and what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, when when you're interacting with writers, when you're interacting with producers, when you're you know you're you're trying to do things, is it is it usually shortened to the point? Is it you know you, you're trying to set things up? powerfully uh, how do you guys usually communicate well let, here let's first let's talk about pitching let's go pitching first and then we'll just talk about regular communication so uh, Patrick you probably do a lot of pitching and get pitched to a lot any thoughts yeah I mean um, you know I've told a lot of people on here before and a lot of other emerging sort of writers you know pitching to me I think everybody's a little bit different um, I worked for a filmmaker who was literally maybe the best BS artist in the world in terms of like, you know, he might not have a script written, but he could pitch the crap out of a, out of a world, you know, and stories and, and tell you a story that you really care about in a room without any bells and whistles. And I think that that's, you know, so, so my, I think my, my point is like, know what you're, know how you are a good communicator and utilize that to, to get the, your point across. Um, Peter Goober, who I, you know, is our CEO here, he wrote a book called Tell the Win, which is all about, you know, use, utilizing story to get what you want in business and any other thing. Um, and I think that it kind of goes into if you're at a dinner party and you're drinking wine with some friends and, you know, you're talking about like a great tele, you know, like the new Black Mirror uh, season that just came on Netflix and or something and you're like talking about what it what is like what episode like moved you the most and why and, and a lot of that is like pitching you know you're you're telling you're telling somebody about about something that you saw or something that's important to you in a way to get them to feel what you feel and i think that that is um there's not like a, a pro forma Oh, thank you. Did he freeze or is it just me? Yeah, I think he froze. 
Okay. Either that or he's making a really good point here. <laughs> it was like right oh, at the yeah. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> I'll text Patrick and I'll see if I can get him back on. Sorry, guys. Thank you. It was a very dramatic pause, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would, I will say from my perspective as a writer, I like minored in acting in school. I used to love performing until I realized I hated performing. I don't like being the center of attention. I don't like, um, I get stage fright. So Pitching is awful to me. I, I feel like I chose writing because I thought I could sit behind a, uh, you know, a desk and just type things in the dark. And when I realized, oh my God, I have to get up there and like do song and dance now, it's a, it's a chore, it's a skill, it's something you, we all have to do. So you gotta just like go for it. But you know, um, if you can think of it as, yeah, you're talking to your friends about something that you love or you're, you know, trying to relay this really great um, story at dinner. Like those are the best ways to try to do something and don't worry about their reaction because nine times out of 10, you won't necessarily get a reaction. And if you're trying to feed off that, it might not work. Um, so, you know, just be passionate about what you're pitching and you go in and you do your thing and then let the chips fall where they may. But yeah, I, I don't think that we all love it because I personally hate it. It's like my least favorite part of the job. I understand. Uh, <laughs> RB, so you've sat on both sides of the desk. I think it helps sitting on both sides of the desk. It totally does. Yeah, it does. But I, I think that I think, you know, any good pitch should answer two questions, which is why does it matter to you and why should it matter to me? And really, and, and the why should it matter to you part of that is why is this important, especially when we're talking about features? What compels you to write this? Why? And it, the, the, believe me, that you know, if you have a three-minute, five-minute pitch, don't spend three minutes talking about this. But right. you know, you can kick off and you could say the name of this film is whatever, and and this is it's a story about, and and you know, I relate to this because it's storytelling. Pitching is storytelling. It's it's sitting in a bar and telling one of your best bar stories. It's it's really if you come from that approach, and I'm not trying to be flip about that. It's really true. I mean, if you come from that approach, you're immediately engaging somebody right you're, you're drawing them in that's the whole idea you tell somebody let me tell you a story and, and you draw in right the other part of it though is why am i why do i want to hear this story and if you if you know who you're pitching to and you understand what their likes and dislikes are maybe what they've done in the past and you know you've done your homework and you know a little bit about them you're going to know how to kind of tailor your pitch a little bit to that person as well um, you know, this is a story that is similar to a film that you produced. You know, I've heard that before, which I like, you know, I mean, they've done a little bit of homework. Um, for me, it's, you know, I'm going to tell you the best version of this story in the shortest period possible to get you engaged and to make you want to hear more or to make you want to read that script. And again, you know, the one thing, one other piece of advice I'll give you, I'll give people out there is that. Just remember the person that you're pitching to, especially if you've been invited to pitch, if you've been asked to come into the room, they want to like you. They want you to win. I, you know, it was the I used to hear it was one of the best pieces of advice I got as an actor back in the day was when, you know, you're going for an audition and you're nervous as hell and, you know, you're, you're sweating and you know, all this other stuff and you go in front of the casting directors. And one day somebody just said to me that, like, you, you realize they want to hire you. Right. They want to like you. And I and all of a sudden it was like a light bulb went off. I'm like, right. They're not the enemy. They're actually, you know, they actually have a job to do. And their job is to like me. And my job is to make them like me. Well, it's no different with a pitch. And that's why if you go in from and that's why I say bar story, because everybody can relate to that. Everybody can relate or a campfire story if you don't drink or if you don't, you know, whatever. But it, the idea is that, you know, you're going to let me tell you a story and let me tell you why it matters to me. And then boom, bring them in and then tell that story in the best way you possibly can. So the advice I got was we all need to go to the bar more often. <laughs> Come meet me tonight if you're in L.A. We're going to be at the, uh, where are we going to be at? Rush Street in Culver. We are. Meet we up. are. Yeah, so, sure. uh, I'm not sure how it's working with Patrick there. It looks like he froze again. Oh, oh, okay. He's just thinking. Sorry <laughs> <laughs> about that. How are you, Patrick? Yeah. That was a great dramatic <laughs> pause. <laughs> For some reason, that it's really weird. Uh, Okay, so that, now let's just talk. Let's just talk in general about just communication. There's, I think, there's a huge difference in this in this industry between over communicating and under communicating, and uh, knowing when what you're saying matters and when it's the right time to call and that kind of thing. Any advice on 
on how to communicate with people effectively in this industry. Let's start with Patrick. Okay. Um, all right. You guys can hear me. Um, I would say uh, the one thing that I would definitely, I don't think is a good way of communicating is sending query letters to executives coldly. Mm -hmm. um, just because we already have so much information, so, so many sources of, you know, where we get material from and, you know, really is a legal issue at the end of the day, you know, um, and it's just, I, you know, I would say going with, if you are John from Omaha and you have a great script that you need, you know, somebody like me to take a look at, you know, I would suggest almost like calling me on the phone might be easier than sending a query letter without any sort of follow-up or just call me just say hey you know what and this has happened before um you know i am a writer i you know i i just need i was wondering if i could you know just be as polite and respectful and brief as possible and i'm much more willing to say yeah you know what just shoot me an email and i'll, I'll send you a, a legal you know Thing. you sign it send it back to me happy to take a look at the at the material um, you know when I'm when I'm working with a lot of emerging writers like you know oftentimes I get kind of bombarded with a lot of material also in one email so let's just say I do make a connection with somebody um, then they'll send me 10 scripts or you know 20 log lines and that's not what I want either I want okay I'll usually literally respond to that email and I'll say send me your best script send me the one that you think is the best piece of material for me right now and then let's talk about something else another script after that if that doesn't work out so um i think that like everybody you know everybody has a um sort of you know nobody has all the time in the world especially people you know that are balancing like work and family and other sorts of types of obligations there's only a certain amount of time in the day to even get your work that you're supposed to get done done, um, let alone like listen to pitches or read material or anything like that without going like absolutely crazy. So make it easier on us by, um, you know, bullet point, like imagine it, imaginatively bullet, bullet pointing out whatever it is you're trying to get across and, um, and, and, you know, hopefully, Whoever is on the other end of the line is not too big of a jerk and willing to uh, take a look and you know give you the time of day. I would say when I am communicating with other people, you know, it really depends on like who I'm communicating with. I don't particularly love chatting at, at nauseum with agents because a I know that they don't like doing that, <laughs> and, um, and b usually it's a very specific business. Uh, question and answer that needs to happen and I just it's about just gathering information um, you know with with other people it's a it's a much more nuanced conversation if I'm talking to another producer about a, a specific project there's a pitch element that goes into that conversation but there's also you know you're creating relationships and so you know um, and then all the other thing is I use my email as sort of my 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 checklist of my to-do list you know so like my personal way of doing things, I do have a physical to-do list, but then I also, you know, I take emails and I literally do not file them until I've, you know, um, executed whatever executing, you know, needs to be done. On it. And then it's like, okay, I have a clean email inbox. Perfect. This is amazing. Um, which never happens, but uh, <laughs> at least I, I try. Yeah, but I think email, you know, typically is... You know, I mean, there's all there's a lot of different thoughts. You know, a lot of CEOs they talked about like CEOs at Fortune 500 companies don't actually um, work well doing emails throughout the day. Um, I kind of find myself the same way. I I I don't like. I'd rather take out chunks of time to go through lots of emails now. I, and I'm also a you know I'm an Eagle Scout, so like my mom always told me when you wanted to get something done pick up the phone and call somebody and get it, get it done. You know, that's the, still the fastest, most effective way of communicating in my, in my opinion. Um, you could send an email that might be like, have all the exclamation marks and time sensitive subject heading and all of that. But somebody else 
might be like in a meeting for two hours and then how like be rushing to a lunch right after that and just sees her email at two thirty when something needed to be done by twelve forty five. You know, um, I I just try to you know I think phone call, text, whatever if you have that is like the easiest way of communicating. And and so if somebody's calling a producer uh, about a project. They should they should be you said polite, but also short and to the point, right? They should get right to the high concept. You think? Yeah, I mean, I th I think so. Like, if it it depends on again, if it's like a pitch, if it's somebody that I that I know, like I have I have friends that, that call me and pitch me ideas on things, you know, and and some of the, some of them, and I don't think they know who they are, are really annoying sometimes because they're like <laughs> they're calling me. And I'm like, dude, I know what this call is going to be about. Like, I don't, I don't need this right now. But I'll, I'll answer. Hey, I've got this great script. Can I send it to you? Would you take? Can you look at? It? You don't have to read it this weekend. Can you read it like in the next couple of weeks? Sure. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. All right. See you on Saturday. We'll go play golf or something. You know. Um, so it's just it it depends. But like I prefer brevity because I am not a really big phone person personally. Um, I, I get like nervous tension when I, like, I'm not, I'm actually more of an introvert than I think I used to be. Um, so, you know, yeah, get to the point, keep it short and sweet. Um, you know, the material will speak for itself at the end of the day. I think that like a phone call from a writer should really be like the verbal equivalent of a cover letter. You really like the cover letter is just so somebody looks at the resume and the resume is just so you can get in the room. You know what I mean? So, like, that's the way I think of it. Good. Cool. Uh, RB, Nicole, any thoughts on, on communication in this industry? I have many, but I'll defer to Nicole first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I just, I, I come from such a different um, side of, the, of the, the, the room than you guys. But, yeah, I mean, for me, communication when it comes to I guess getting notes and, and dealing with coworkers and all that stuff is, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm a crazy insecure writer. Pretty much all my writer friends are crazy insecure writers. Just be kind. We need notes. We want notes, but, um, but you know, it's always good to lead with the, the nice and then give the constructive, you know, here's what we need to work on kind of stuff. Um, and just treat others the way that, you know, you'd like to be treated. So, you know, but yeah, everybody's busy. Everybody has a million things to do. Um, we all want to be as supportive and helpful as possible. But if we don't always have the time right when you want it, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't want to help or, or that we can't just maybe not at that moment. I mean, those kind of things. Just be understanding and, and treat others how you'd like to be treated, I guess. Very good. Cool. RV? Yeah, I mean, to, for me, approach is everything. It's everything. And I think that this is one of those areas where when people say, oh, my God, there's 50,000 scripts that get registered with the WGA a year and there's this and there's that where you can get a competitive advantage over many people. OK, obviously, the writing is going to give you the biggest competitive advantage, but approach. I can't tell you, man, I, I probably and this is no exaggeration. I mean, keeping in mind that, you know, I'm out in front of stage 32, obviously out in front of my social media accounts. And so there's a lot of different ways that people can reach me. I'm not exaggerating. I will get probably 50 people a week that will ask me, you know, sight unseen, never met me before, just started following me, just joined stage 32. Can you read my script? Can you, you know, uh, or I have a story, can you write it? Um, you know, I have a film, can you find, I have a, a script, can you finance it? I don't know you, I've never met you before, I don't know anything about you, you haven't asked me anything about me. Um, actually in the book, there's a great story about an award-winning director and, and a, a, a scene at the Austin Film Festival where two screenwriters approached him and one of them did it the wrong way and that person got eviscerated and the other the next person ended up being a lifelong friend and because it was all about approach and ended up getting a manager and an agent through this guy and everything like that. It's all about approach and that is completely in your control. The other thing that's completely in your control is research. You you have to know who you're talking to. I can't tell you how many friends I have in the business that, for example, I have a friend that is the head of a production company that does nothing but horror, who tells me about, you know, a million stories about being pitched comedy scripts and right. rom-coms. And, and right. you know, you don't realize, like, the mark you're putting on yourself when you do that. And 
what you're putting out there when you do that. This again, you know, it's a relationship business. I think one of the things that uh, kind of you, Patrick, you kind of buried the lead there in a, in a way, but you know, you said you have friends that pick up the phone to call you to ask you to read scripts. Those, those friends are going to, of course, get, you know, put higher on the pile than somebody that you don't know that just approaches you unless you get blown away by some sort of, you know, elevator pitch or something. But, you know, you though, you know, I, one manager said to me one time and I've heard it from others. I've asked others if this is true, but they said, look, I have three piles. Okay. I have my clients, I have my referrals and I have everything else. And the guy said to me, he goes, the everything else pile, he goes, I don't think I've touched in four years. Because I have my clients, you know, and then I have people that are saying to me, you need, and, and what is that you need to read this thing? That's a trusted source. You know, it's that whole idea that if I tell you I'm great, you know, Nicole, if I tell you how great I am as a writer, you're going to go, yeah, yeah, you and everybody else. But if you're a great friend with Patrick and Patrick says, hey, you know, you need to read this guy. Of course, you're going to be more inclined to do that. It's all relationship building. It's all relationship building. So to me, it's all about approach. And yes, just to put a button on that even though this was a long-winded answer, so it's going to be ironic, but concise <laughs> and everything. I mean, seriously, don't write emails that are like, that nobody has time. I mean, just to the point, to the point, to the point. Nobody has time. Nobody has time. Everybody's busy. Value people's time. Right. Very good. Very good. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm also surprised so many people, It's it only takes a moment to go on IMDb Pro or IMDb and see what kind of movies people do, right? It's like... Mm -hmm. So, we have a saying around here at stage 32 to some uh, we, a response, sort of a can response, but Google is your friend. Yeah. yeah. God so. created Google for you. <laughs> <laughs> so if Amanda's available, let's uh, let's see what kind of questions we have. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah, this has been awesome. I mean, so informative and just so much fun. And um, I'll get to as many questions as we can. So we'll try and keep our answers concise um, to the last point. Um, you guys had touched on this earlier on in the panel, but I'm still getting, we have literally dozens of questions about how to get a manager or agent. I know we talked about it before, but can you guys offer any other spe um, specific information to the group? By the way, we should, we should actually do a how to get a manager or an agent one day, but go ahead. Sure. Sorry. I mean, very briefly for me on my side of it, uh, it's not easy. I know, you know, I, I had a writer that I worked with, a very successful writer who was like, you know, if it's a good script, you throw it off a bridge and someone will read it. And that's just not true. I mean, it's what, you know, Richard and Patrick have been saying. It, it, it really, there are so many scripts out there. There's so many of us who want to be, you know, writers that, um, and, and unfortunately a lot of them aren't great. There are, you know, so we've all become a little bit numb to reading so many scripts. So yeah, it's, it's relationships. It's getting a trusted source. The way I got my, any agent or manager I've ever had is through a friend who is a working writer who's maybe higher level, who read my stuff, who helped me, gave me notes or cultivated me or just liked it off the bat. And I had enough of a relationship with them that they said, sure, I will recommend you to my agent or my manager. And that's the only way I got read by that person. So yeah. if I just had straight sent it myself, I doubt it. And I've also had people send to their agents who just ignored me, who didn't give me the time of day, even though they had a client saying, you should read this person. So it's hard, but it's possible. And you just have to keep at it. And my biggest uh, advice would just be, be patient. Cool. I had three opportunities to be signed. I signed with the third one. The first two came from relationships. The first two came from uh, a, you know, somebody that had read my work that, uh, you know, works in the industry that, uh, two different people, I should say, that recommended me to, uh, managers who read it. And, uh, I had meetings with both of them. And I just didn't think they were a fit, which is another, you know, also something that, you know, probably another panel for another day, how, but you know, how the wrong manager could be, you know, the no manager, you don't have to have a manager. Being with the wrong manager is almost worse than not having a manager at all. And then the way I got to the manager I'm with now really was through a contest. It started with the contest. And my, I got to a point where I decided that I was going to be very, very I was going to vet everything and be very, very, I was going to invest in myself. I put, I put aside money for myself to enter contests, get notes, things like that. When I was first starting, you know, I skipped some dinners, didn't go out to the bar all the time or, you know, go whatever the hell it was, skip the vacation or whatever. 
and use that as sort of a, sort of a slush fund to help further my career and, and be serious about what I was doing. And part of that was I was only going to enter contests that provided me access if I did well. And I didn't care about another, you know, uh, another final draft. I have it. Uh, I didn't care about a thousand dollars. It's great. But I was just going to, if I won a thousand dollars, I was going to go right back into it. I wanted meetings. I wanted access. I wanted reads. I wanted people to read. And uh, I won a contest and I got a couple of reads and uh, it landed, it went from a, an agent to a manager to a director that really liked it. That director brought it to his manager and that's how I landed David. And, uh, you know, David ended up reading more of the work and, you know, he liked that one script, but he wanted to read other stuff that I had. And which also, by the way, make sure you have more than one script, um, you know, because I'm always going to ask what else do you have, no matter how much they love that one script. Uh, but he read the other material and that's how it came to be. So there's a million paths, you know what I mean? But it all really, to me, it all begins and ends with putting yourself in the best position. And that's the relationship building, not wasting your money on people that aren't qualified, not wasting your money on things that don't provide access. Put your, put your dollars and put your efforts into things that get you those relationships and get you the access and the leads that you need to win champions. Very good. And, and I just add just a, one, one thing, which is when they ask, what, what other scripts do you have? Uh, anything you give them needs to be better than the one that, you, that they saw first. And because I see so many people who they'll get a, a, ma a manager or an agent interested, and then they will send them all of their learning scripts. And that's the end. So just, just to be careful on that. Uh, Amanda? All right, guys. Um, a question that keeps coming up here within the, the chat box is um, when people are looking for their first break into, uh, into their first scripts, a lot of people are asking, should they be looking at gearing their writing towards streaming platforms like Netflix or Hulu or Amazon versus traditional platforms? Or maybe, Nicole, some people were asking uh, cable versus network TV. So can you guys kind of talk about what the market is dictating right now for someone to break in? I mean, briefly, I would say, I know a lot of people say stuff like that. If you're breaking in, I would say, you just write what you want to see on TV, write what you're passionate about, write what you wish was on TV right now for you to watch. And then, you know, from there, maybe try to tell. But when people try to tell you like, oh, what's really hot right now are medical dramas, write a medical drama, but you have no medical drama experience, or you're not even interested in medical shows. Personally, that's never worked for me. You got to so do what your passion is, do what, you know, there's network TV still going strong. There's there's um, streaming TV. There's cable TV. I mean, what do you want to write for? That's what you should um, write yourself, personally speaking. Because if you get hired on a show, you want it to be the right fit for you. You want you don't want to be totally out of your element because you wrote something that was out of your element because that's what somebody told you to do. Cool. Other thoughts? I agree. If you're breaking in, write what, write what you want to write. Don't worry about the market. Don't worry about all that stuff. You know, c control what you can control, which is the material. Very good. Any Anything you want to say on that, Patrick? You know, I would say for, for film, it's probably, you know, I wouldn't, I, if, if I was to say, write something for Netflix, I don't think that anybody would know what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, too, I guess. You know, or Amazon. Yeah. Right, too. Like, like, <laughs> Just, um, you know, you see movies like Bright that just came out, you know, uh, that has an insane, you know, studio level budget, um, action budget. And then you have you know, a movie that we've done like Burning Sands, which has a very small little indie budget. So I would say that like, you know, Netflix and the Amazons and the, the you know, the, the all of the streaming SVOD services for the app for features um are are really like working competitively with the traditional you know stu the studio and indie system right now so it's all i wouldn't concentrate on that part of it when it comes to your writing um, amanda all right um next question here i have is from giacomo and he wants to know how valuable is it getting coverage? And is there such thing as coverage with consideration so he can test marketability for the script? 
Um, I think like, so wait, just so I understand the question correctly, are they asking about like how, like if we do coverage and recommend something or we have I an think, I think just in general, getting your script coverage, like getting coverage on your script. And then if, uh, if that, if that coverage has a recommend or a consider, um, how valuable is that for a writer going into the marketplace? He's probably talking paid coverage, I would think. Yeah, to me, that's, it's not, again, it's not as valuable. It depends on who's writing the coverage. Okay. You know, that at the end of the day, it's like, if, you know, if somebody sends me coverage on a script, I don't know them from that. I don't, I don't know what kind of movies that person likes. You know, they might be the biggest Steven Seagal fans in the world, you know, and I might not <laughs> necessarily want to make a Steven Seagal movie. Um, so, you know, it's sort of like when I get a lot of like letters from people saying, oh, well, this script won, you know, the um, East St. Louis uh, screenwriting competition, you know, f finalist or, you know, the South Dallas, you know, whatever. It's like that stuff doesn't mean anything to me because I can't contextualize it. You know, I can't I can't compare it to anything that I know um, other than like prestige stuff like the Nichols or the Blacklist or things like, you know. Like a great stage 32 um you know recommendation or something like that so to me it doesn't really have a bearing unless i mean coverage from an agency sometimes that i know and work with is important because it, you know it's 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 gone through a me mechanism that i'm familiar with having worked in an agency you know um like it got to a certain level but if it's just a paid guy that's doing coverage that you pay a hundred dollars to or whatever um and he attaches the coverage with the script i'm not really going to pay it a lot of attention i, I could jump in real quick i mean it's gonna this is going to sound self-serving but part of the entire reason for starting stage 32 obviously was to give people the opportunity to network and and uh, learn from uh, network with people that are try that are like-minded and and uh, learn from people that are doing it and our we have a basic coverage service which really is for people first draft kind of you know looking for some feedback and those are industry readers those are studio readers um, but our main coverage is with executives and you get to pick the executive and you get to pick you know exactly who's covering your script and you get to choose them and there's even a service where you can, they can read the script and then you can get on the phone with them. That's not a shameless plug. There's, there's a, the reason that we did that and we decided to do that was so that the people that were investing them hard earned money and, you know, to get coverage and were serious about getting coverage and getting good coverage, uh, knew exactly who they were getting coverage from and they were getting it from somebody working in the industry right now. And to me, that's invaluable. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, getting recommend coverage from somebody like Patrick, you know, carries a hell of a lot more weight than, you know, you got recommend coverage from screenwriting service B, you know, reader DZ, you know, it's, it's just the truth. It's just the truth. Um, and it's the same thing with contests, by the way, it, it is true. If, if you win Joe's contest, nobody's going to care. If you know, you were a finalist at the nickel, people are going to care. And that's just the reality. Absolutely. Cool. Amanda? All right. I've got a question here from Marcy, and Marcy wants to know, so much of this is, quote unquote, who you know. So are there suggestions for people in places like Iowa on how to network with people who can't help get our scripts seen? I feel like we kind of covered that a little bit. I feel like it's, 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 yeah, I mean, I think that you have online opportunities everywhere. I mean, again, of course, I'm going to plug Stage 32 because this is what we do. It's free. I can plug it. Um, you know, go on there and network. You could. It's an opportunity. But if you don't want to be on Stage 32, God knows. There's Facebook. There's, there's I don't know, LinkedIn. I don't know. But, you know, you get my point. The point of the matter is, is that there are opportunities to get in front of people all the time. The difference between the people that do get in front of of the people that this, you know the decision makers and the people that can move the needle on their career, the, really the difference between them all is approach. I mean that's that's my belief anyway, and my experience I should say. I'll just chime in really quick. There was a one of my really really close friends is a manager at a really at a A level management company who um, found all of his initial clients like from the internet. 
you know, he literally found screenplays that he really enjoyed reading off of a certain amount of internet uh, screenplay sites. And he got them all signed and he got most of them. They're, you know, they're, they're I think they're all rep at either WME or CAA at this point, because those are where his connections were at the time. So, um, yeah, with the, with the internet now, I mean, you could literally, you don't have to work in LA, even if you are an established screenwriter, like you can pretty much re work remotely. We're, we're working with a screenwriter now uh, on our like third movie with him who um, doesn't have an address, which is also really annoying sometimes, <laughs> but like he's constantly <laughs> the ability to just kind of, you know, um, wing it and, and wherever he is because he's he's got his phone and he's got his computer that being said i hate to do the 180 but for tv you almost I have to have to be in LA. or new yeah. york there's some shows in new york but for the most part all the shows come out of la and you kind of have to be there because there is a room that we all go into together and you have to be seen and you have to show up so unfortunately if that's if tv is your focus i would recommend moving out here and making a go of it and trying it. I have to plug in my computer, so I'm moving you. I would also say, um, yes, I, I at, at a certain point in time, if you live in Omaha, Nebraska, or wherever, you're not, you're not near Los Angeles, make a trip to LA, get an Airbnb for, you know, room for 20 bucks a night somewhere, and uh, set up as many coffees and drinks and meetings and make it a work trip for yourself. And do that well in advance so that when you get here, your day is, you know, you're, you're, you're jam packed. You're, you're showing everybody who you are. Because that is really important. You are going to have to eventually be in a room with people, um, not just on Skype. But again, you know, one thing, one thing to stress too is that, you know, if, you, if it's features, totally agree with Nicole. I mean, if it's, if it's TV, absolutely, you got to be out here. But if, if it's, you know, film, film is happening everywhere and things are being produced everywhere. Um, Again, there's no excuse not to be networking with producers, financiers, director. I mean, you name it. You should be casting a wide net because you don't know who's looking for material and where they're looking for material. I know I have a producer friend that now is doing nothing in the U.S. anymore. He's, you know, looking for European co-productions, and I mean, it's 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 crazy. It's just a different world. So you know, don't limit yourself either. You know, just be out there and just put in the time networking. Treat it like a job, and you'll see the benefits. You'll start making those relationships. And by the way, no connection's a bad connection either. You never know who's going to know who. I hear this all the time. Like I got a network request on Stage 32 from a producer in, you know, in the UK. Like, why do I need that? And I'm like, if you're asking that question, then you're not paying attention to what's happening in the business. You got to know. You have to know. And no, like I said, no connection's a bad connection. That's also a be kind to everyone because you never know. That's right. You never know who's going to be. Right? <laughs> who's going to be a decision maker tomorrow? You never know. I, I'll just tell a quick story about that. I. Uh, it wasn't really be clean, but just how small the world is here. And we had maybe the worst interview of my life. It was almost like a nervous breakdown, one of one of run away back to Seattle moment, um, where I could not like I, I felt like Chris Farley in uh in Saturday Night Live when it's like, you know, the Chris Martin <laughs> show is in, interviewing guys like Martin. I literally could not come up with anything smart to say in the interview. It was the worst interview of my life. And like five years after that, now I'm working with the executive that I oh, man. interviewed. <laughs> yeah. And when we first met each other, you know, it was like one of those, I know you from somewhere. Oh. Was, you know, I felt very, very much like George Costanza in the moment, but like <laughs> what I kind of took from it was, uh, man, you know, the like, yeah, put your constant, like understand that this is, you think about Hollywood, Hollywood's kind of like a really big public high school. You know, there's like probably about, depending on whether you're not, if you're in film, there's probably about 2,000 people that you need to know. You know what I mean? So, and you will constantly see them, con you know, here and there. Um, LA is a small town too. You always run into people, you know, at coffee shops or random, random places. So. Very good. Um, Amanda, do you have another one real fast? I do. I, I, we've got we have hundreds of questions, so we'll just. I know we're we're already, um, you know, rolling up here. So this is a great question from Martin, and Martin wants to know: Would you recommend doing a short film based on your script as a way to pitch it? 
Anybody want to chime in on that? I, I definitely think if you can swing it, that's that's a really valuable tool because um, if you want to be a director and you don't like a lot of directors, I first time directors I've worked with have come out of film school, so they usually have short films I can see, kind of get the get the gauge their you know their craft. Um, but I think that like you know even with people that are just fresh out of film school, like a proof of concept uh, trailer, quote unquote, or a short film, something that gives you like, you know, a sense of the, the, the palette and the tone and the characters and the world, I think is like really, really helpful. But it's also expensive and time consuming and not everybody can has the opportunity to do that. But um, I do love looking at that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, if, if cost isn't a factor, if you or if you can go raise the funds, whatever. I think the more that you can control, the better. I mean, I think, in, in, especially in this world right now, the the better the calling card, or the bigger the calling card, or the more grand the calling card, the better. So, yeah, I mean, if you can control your own content right now, it's it's a great time to be doing it. Very good. Uh, well, we've hit two thirty here, so why don't we bring this to a close? Anybody got any any last advice for writers who are trying to break in or trying to establish a career or anything like that. Just if you said one or two sentences, what would it be? Uh, just Thanks. keep writing. Perfect. If you're a writer, keep writing. That's what I, it's just, you're, you're gonna get better, hopefully, every script, and you just amass material. So when you do get an opportunity, when you meet somebody at a party, and they ask you what you do, and you say you're a writer, and they go, oh, really? Do you have anything I could read? And you go, boom, I got this, or I'll send it to you later. I mean, don't do that at the party, but you have it. Just have your arsenal to be able to give to somebody when, because you never know when an opportunity will arise. That's my advice. Great. I'd say that's really, really great advice. I mean, I would, I would say the same thing. Like, one of my mentors always told me, producers should always be friends with writers, because writers, you know, are constantly creating. They're the only people in Hollywood mm -hmm that are in the entertainment industry that are constantly, you know, the writer by definition writes. So they, you can write on while at night while you're climbing Everest, or you can write, write in your prison cell, or you can write in your computer. In <laughs> all right. And you know, it's just like, you're constantly creating whether or not that's good stuff or bad stuff. It doesn't really matter, but like the practicing, you know, you can't practice directing by yourself. You can't yeah. practice really acting by yourself, but you can constantly, you know, work on writing by yourself, which I think is extremely valuable. Very good, RB. I would say don't listen to all the negativity and uh, don't follow the pack, especially the online pack. It's it's good to have. It's good to use online to forge positive relationships, and there are a lot of positive writers out there, and we've seen a lot of our writers form online writing groups and stuff like that that have ended up being fantastic for them. But you know, there is so much. This is such a challenging business to begin with. And, you know, we always say it's a business to no, know, but it only takes one yes and all that. Don't follow that mentality and listen to everybody talk about, again, like I said earlier, you know, the 50,000 scripts that get registered and, you know, all this crap. To me, when I hear that, I, my reaction is to say, what gives me a competitive advantage in every single one of those spots? Well, the first one is obvious. Write the best you can, Become a, keep, keep writing, as Nicole said, become a better writer, uh, do everything you can to become a better writer, but then put yourself in a position to, you know, network, build those relationships and understand that those things take time. Think about your best friendships. You know, they didn't happen overnight. You didn't become best friends with somebody overnight. You took time. you got to cultivate these relationships. And then the third thing is to put yourself in the best position at all times. And like I said, if you're going to invest yourself, make sure you invest in yourself, make sure you're not wasting your money, make sure you're not throwing it away. Put yourself in positions where you know you're spending wisely. You're going to the right conferences. You're attending the right things. All of those things will give you those competitive advantages. And the thing that'll give you the biggest competitive advantage, to be perfectly honest with you, besides being a great writer and everything, is staying positive. It really will. If you stay positive and you keep fighting and you keep grinding and you understand that this is again, as I said earlier, a marathon and not a sprint, you will have a competitive advantage over those people that say, you know what, I don't feel like writing tonight. I'm going to go sit on the couch. Um, that's my advice. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you. I want to, I want to first thank our guest, uh, Nicole. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us and sharing your perspective. Uh, Patrick, thank you so much. We, we needed to hear from Mandalay, so that's great. 
RB, you've been incredibly kind to share uh, your information in multiple ways. We appreciate that. And uh, if you hold up the book again, we'll tell people to head that direction. <laughs> well, I want to just say I'm very, entirely grateful to you. Screenwriting, Screenwriters Day would not exist if not for Hal. Uh, he has made this whole entire thing happen. He has been so generous to bring us in and to bring Stage 32 into the mix and everything like that. So deeply appreciative for that. And yes, I will do the shameless plug of the book on, <laughs> there on Amazon. I th you know, go go to Amazon. I think it's got Excellent. 30, 30 something. Yeah. Uh, oh, just a couple other things. Cheryl just told me um, we actually at Screenwriting You we have a how to get an agent webinar tomorrow at noon. That's free. Uh, so for those of you who want to do that, just go jump on our Facebook page and and the, the uh, promo is there for that. Um, also tonight there's a party put on by Stage 32 down at uh, where is it? At Rush Street uh, in Culver City. So Culver City, Rush Street. Yep, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be all writers. So I mean, I mean, it's gonna be raucous, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think we've got seventy or eighty people coming. But anybody, everybody who's on the line is invited. Please yes. um, show up and introduce yourself, and uh, yeah, we'll have fun together. Uh, anything else you guys wanted to say before we close out? Thank you. Um, Okay. Well, actually, I just, you guys, I just wanted to pop in. Patrick, do you mind just sharing with the writers about your upcoming writer development lab? Um, yeah, so uh, we are going to be having a lab, what is it, January 22nd. Um, and every week, it's going to be an hour a week uh, where we're just going to, you know, talking about like uh, breaking down scripts and things that I love about, you know, the business and screenwriting and helping um get scripts to where they need to be and you know it's a very very as you can tell with if you're watching this i'm a very uh interactive guy i love you know just having conversations with people and and helping sort of uh wrangle you know people in the direction um that i think is is good for the project and so hopefully um get to spend time with you guys uh in the coming weeks great excellent sounds like a cool thing yeah it's going to be I, awesome. I like you guys' programs, RB. The the uh, the whole thing of being of interacting directly with producers and people inside the industry that really makes sense. Hey, so. I'll tell, if I could tell a really really quick story, the the and writers will appreciate this. When I first and this is why I mean this this was even before I had started Stage Thirty Two. I went to uh, I had written a script. I think it was the first script I had written, and I wanted. And again, you know, when you're on the producing side and you're reading scripts, it's a very different animal than when it's your own. And you know, you're you're you have the same insecurities and the same everything. You know, it's the same thing that every writer has. And uh, but I wanted to go through a rewriting course before, like you know, just a quick webinar, just to make sure I had my head on straight and everything like that. And I went online and. Uh, tried to find one and and I found a guy who a beautiful web page he had and it was all like I worked for and it was like Warner Brothers and Fox and you know I've done all this and done all that and I'm like man I've never heard of this guy before so I did a quick Google search because Google is your friend and uh, I found that brilliantly he had put up some other stuff claiming that he was a screenwriter too but brilliantly with the same exact photo that he had on the page the sales page for the webinar well, that was the same photo he had on his LinkedIn, so I knew it was the same guy. And he was an insurance adjuster from Omaha, Nebraska, and that's no lie. And that was when I sat there and I said, okay, you know, if I go through with stage 32, because at this point it was just in the planning stage, when we get to the point where we're going to bring education into the mix and educators into the mix, they're going to be people doing it right now. And, you know, since we've started, I mean, I've been on plenty of panels with, you know, writers that did it 20 years ago and did it 30 years ago and are giving advice that, you know, was fitting back in, you know, 1985, but isn't fitting today. And it, it aggravates me. It really, to be, it, it, it's, I take it personally. So yeah, we really, really try to bring in people that are doing it right now. We vet everybody and uh, to make sure that they're giving actionable, applicable and timely advice all the time. So thank you. I appreciate that. I really do. Very, very good. And and on our end, again, thank you so much to to RB, to Stage 32, to thank Amanda, uh, for hosting this and for putting on the party tonight. Um, you guys are amazing to work with. Uh, right back at you, my friend. Right back at you. I'm excited to see you tonight. All right. With that, we'll close it out. If, you, if either one of you can join us, please do. 
All right. So we'll be back in All right. See you guys tonight. And thank you, Nicole and Patrick. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye, everyone.